Mr. Woodcock is a field solicitor, United States Department of the Interior in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma, College of Law, 1980. He has been with the Tulsa Field Office, Department of the Interior, since 1983. His specialty is Native American law issues, including Osage wills and trusts. And believe me, there's a lot of people that want to know about those. And please refrain your questions. If you have personal issues about any of this, issues and trust, please keep it to uh, a first personal level outside of here. He's just uh, going to be trusting with us. Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alan R. Woodcock. Thank you. Um, I'm Alan Woodcock. I'm the field solicitor with the Department of the Interior, which means that we are the attorneys that represent the department. I have uh, three disclaimers I'd like to make before I start. First, that uh, I am speaking today on my own capacity. I'm not speaking for the federal government. Uh, that may seem a little strange, but that's the disclaimer. The second thing is that the um, there are. I'm going to give general rules, and so they may or may not apply to specific situations. So uh, you need to seek advice regarding a particular situation. Don't just take what I say. Um, the uh, if you are doing a trust, our office will eventually review the trust, and if there are issues that we see, we will get back to you. Uh, under the terms of the regulations, you can ask for the solicitor's office to review a will when it's, ex when it's executed, before the person dies. So you can ask for us to review a will. We will get back to you if we see any problems with it. But that doesn't count as a formal will proof, but we can do that. The other thing I'd like to say is, unlike the previous speaker, I'm not going to tell a joke. Um, I have to get permission to speak, and uh, one of the conditions is that I don't tell jokes. Uh, that's because I held jokes so poorly. So, uh, if I say something that seems mildly amusing, I would appreciate it if you would not laugh because you'll get me in trouble. All right. Uh, I'm going to start off with wills, uh, then I'll get to trust. These are both methods for uh, transferring your property, your restricted Osage property, land, uh, IM accounts, or head rights, uh, to whoever you want it to go to after your death. Um, so the first, the first uh, way of doing it is a will. Those wills have to be executed in conformity with the laws of the state of execution. So. If you are a resident of Oklahoma, you get the will, you execute the will, of course, of the law of Oklahoma. If you're a resident of Minnesota, you get it done under the laws of the state of Minnesota. We adopt those foreign rules for purposes of execution. For purposes of, uh, for purposes of interpretation, we use Oklahoma law. Um, Oklahoma law requires two witnesses. They have to be disinterested witnesses. That is, they cannot take an interest under the will. So they have to be disinterested. Um, there can be a self-proven statement which is attached to it, which eliminates the need to try to call the witnesses when you're doing the probate. Um, my advice is on doing a will is to one is to either get a private lawyer to help you execute a will or send the will in to us for review before before you die so that we can we can get back to you if there's any, any problems. Um, there are some special rules about Osage wills. Uh, and these rules are the same as the trust as well. These are special rules. First, um, you can give a non-Osage only a life estate. You can't give them anything more than the life estate. So uh, typically we will see a will which leaves a spouse, a non-Osage spouse, a life estate. So that's the most that you can give them. A life estate is an estate 
that lasts solely for that person's lifetime. So it terminates upon their death. Um, the, if you have designated someone to receive the interest after death, that person would be hit right automatically. If you not designate someone, if you just said children of, heirs of, then, then the state court has to decide who those people are. But generally, one life estate in Long Osage. Um, along that line, the BIA needs to know when that life tenant dies. So family members or whatever need to let the BI know when they die because we don't have any real way of checking up on that. So that's the thing. You can give as many life estates, not you should be, you can give as many not, let me try this again. You can give as many Osage life estates as you want, subject to the rule against perpetuities, which is remote vesting, but I won't get into that. But basically, you can give several non several Osage life estates, but at the point that a non-Osage gets into the mix, they can only be a life estate, and then after that has to vest absolutely in an Osage. So if you give it to your spouse, your non-Osage spouse for life, the remainder then has to vest in people who are Osage descent, your children or, or something like that. Now it doesn't if you're actually doing well, it doesn't have to be your children. It doesn't actually have to be your spouse, but those are the, those are the ones we normally see. Um, you cannot give in a will, you cannot give it to a testamentary trust unless you follow the requirements of the testamentary trust. And that is that uh, the secretary has to be named as a trustee and um, Again, the beneficiaries have to be, you, you can't have a non-Osage taking it in fee. So the thing is, if you execute a will and leave it to a testimony trust, you really need to get some, us to look at it before, before, you, before you rely on it, because it may be invalid. Um, the, um, the, the, us looking at the will does not, count for the formal will approval process. We look at it, we approve it as to form, but it doesn't count as to the formal will approval process. Now, the, um, okay, um, when the person who executes the will dies, uh, the wills of Osage have to be approved by the superintendent prior to probate and state courts. You actually have, for the Osage, you have this sort of odd kind of situation. Um, the will approval process is done by the superintendent, and that uh, will approval decision is binding on the um, state court for, for purposes of the probate. But you actually do the probate, that is the division of the property in state court. Now that's different from, I think, any other system. Uh, for, the, for the General Law Act Indians, the, the process is done entirely, the probate process is done entirely within the, the, the Department of the Interior and the Office of Interior Appeals. For the five tribes, the um, the, the probate process is done entirely in state court. But here we have this, in, this bifurcation where we have to approve the will and the, um, the, the state court then probates it. And there's different rules on who gets to say what. So I, I probably will win all of those. The, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have, I have a question since you're on this. Um, my name is Margo Gray and I, I'm a Osage Minerals Council. Uh, member and one of the questions we get a lot from not so much of the people that live in Osage County or maybe in the Tulsa area but it's outside of um, um, somewhere like in the state but and if their family member has a will here um, you know they we get a lot of questions and we we, you know, we just send them over to the superintendent's office because we don't have a solicitor in 
in-house over at uh, Osage. But the question is, is how long does it take for that will, say if ever, all the paperwork is in order, we send it to your office, what is the time frame for turnaround? Just, just a... For our will approved process, the time frame, first you have to file the, the, right. the petition and go with the superintendent's office. They sat down for hearing. They, they publish a notice and they generally sat down for hearing, say, within 30 days. Just to get we, a will approved? Yeah, well, okay. that will be the will approval proceeding. And I or someone in my office will conduct the will approval proceeding. And we're assuming there's no contest, there's no, you know, no, no objection to the will itself. We will conduct the hearing. We wait for the, a copy of the transcript. We get a copy of the transcript, and we will do a recommendation to the superintendent and draft order. And I'm going to say that probably takes about two to three weeks. We will get back to the superintendent. The superintendent will make a decision. Um, then, as soon as that, as soon as that's done, then the person can take the will to the state court for the probing. So, if, if all goes well, two months. I think, um, I think she might have been asking about the how long it would take if a citizen had a will and they wanted to do a look at it and approve it to um, return it to them. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, like, that, that's the time frame. That's the time frame if after your family member has died and you want to go ahead and yeah. probate it. How long would it take? Uh, that depends on all sorts of questions about how much we have to do. Otherwise, um, I, I don't know, probably two or three weeks. Mr. Woodcock? Yes. While you're on that probate, and speaking of it, you know, I wish I knew how this got out in the public that wills didn't need to be probated. Could you kind of expand on that and maybe your ideas? Because I hear that from all of them. The trust. The probate system trust. doesn't have to. The will is oh. as good as it is. Well, they may be discussing trust, and we're going to talk about trust in a few minutes. Wills have to be approved by the superintendent and have to be probated. Trusts are approved by the superintendent. There's some rules about that, but the trust does not go to state court, does not go to probate at all. Mm -hmm. So if they're doing a trust, they avoid the whole probate process. Right. Now there may be reasons why they want to do a will as opposed to a trust, but that's the one difference really between the trust and the wills. Wills have to go to state court eventually. We, we do the approval, but the wills have to go to state court. The trust do not go to state court. They're done entirely with, by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Okay, so um, the will approval process in the, part, in the department here is initiated by a petition that's filed by a family member or by an attorney for the family member. It, it, comes, to our, it comes to our office, uh, the the Osage agency will set it down for hearing, generally within 30 days, depending on when it comes in. They publish notes. There has to be a, a publication in the newspaper, and the, the agency will arrange that publication. We then conduct a will approval hearing. Uh, we can do that in form of the regulations, evidence. Uh, may be introduced as to the validity of the will. Uh, we use the rules of the state of Oklahoma. There can be, we give notice to the the beneficiaries listed in the will and to any Osage, any heirs, that have to be Osage, but any heirs under the intestate statute. That would generally be wife and children. Uh, if there are no wife, no spouses, Sorry. Those spouses or children, then um, there may be brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins. We give notice to all those people, and any of those people have the right to come in and do a contest. They can actually contest the validity of the will. 
we will then conduct a hearing, and it will take a while, we will conduct a hearing on the validity of that, we will make a decision. We will make a recommendation to the and make the decision. We don't have that many contests, but we have occasionally have, have contests, so we will do that. Um, in the normal scheme of things, the superintendent issues order approving or disapproving the will. Then the district court takes that will and does a probate. And that is they decide who under that will takes an interest and they distribute the property. They, the, the final order comes to our office and we recommend the distribution. Um, we have had a question, a lengthy question, about um, whether a will must be approved by the superintendent if there are no restricted assets in the estate. We have taken the position that there's no restricted assets in the estate. We do not do a will approval. We will occasionally do such a will approval at the request of the, the family. Um, because for various reasons they, they may need it. The, the state court in Pawhuska in Osage County believes that it has to be approved by the superintendent before they will initiate the program. So we will occasionally do a will approval proceeding, even though there are no restricted assets. Um, we have—I've uh, been doing this for quite a while. I've, we've never really actually had a case that was appealed up so we could get some sort of ruling on whether, whether that was the rule. But we—we we take the position that it doesn't have to be approved. The district court in Bosca takes the position that it does have to be approved. So. There you go. We, we will do it as an accommodation to the parties, but that's the only thing. Um, that's the, the will approval process. We'll, we'll talk now about trust. Um, trust allow Osage individuals, and frankly, this is also kind of unique because it's pursuant to the 1978 Act, and I'm not really aware of other tribes that have this power. This is something that's kind of unique to Osage, the Osage Agency. Um, trust can be executed by the settlor, and that's the one actually executing the trust. We call them the settlor. They have to be notarized, and there's no requirement for a witness. Um, under the statute, they must provide for last deals the expenses, debts and allowance for individual dependent on the settlor. And uh, occasionally we'll have trust that try to eliminate that and we have to say no, the statute requires that to be in there. So that will be in there. The trust has to be approved by the, the, the secretary or the superintendent. Um, and I'm going to get to all, what all that means, but basically uh, the trust can dispose of anything that's reached any Osage restricted property. So land, head right, IM counts. Those are the three main things that we see. Um, the trust that cannot dispose of restricted or trust property that the individual may have at another agency. So if they have Pawnee trust property, the trust can't work on that. They'll have to make other arrangements for that. But it, it works on anything that's restricted for those ages. Um, it's subject to the same life estate rules that we discussed for wills. So the trust could provide a non Osage gets the life estate. After that, it has to vest in Osages. Uh, and that's just, that's just a rule for both trusts and wills. Yes? Yes. Probably, and I, I'm looking at Myron because through a, the email correspondence we get with our shareholders, that is probably one of a very common question is that how do you get that information if you know someone has given had life uh, use of it and then it and they willed it to somebody else? How do they get it back? I don't know what to tell them besides contact you because well, it, it's it's a it's a kind of like an investigation. You've got to go and find that because we know that there are so many 
head rights that have were willed to non-Osage spouses, and then they give it to whoever they want to, who is non-Osage. Okay. And so we've got them out there, and we don't know how to get them back. Well, first, <clears throat> the, the rule about non-Osage is only getting a life estate, that was in the 1978 Act. Right. So that if there is a, a will or whatever that gave it to a non Osage um, in fee prior to 1978, the 1978 Act won't operate to cut that off. So if they've had it for a long time, then they still they get to keep it. The um, the the question may be how do you if 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 the person has a life estate, they don't have technically the power to leave it to somebody else because it terminates at their death. They don't have the power to transfer it. They don't have the power to uh, leave it in the will to somebody else. How do we you know? Well, that's the hard part. If the, if the family knows the life tenant has died, then the family needs to contact the agency because they will terminate the, the head right families. Um, and then where does that head right go? Well, it, it goes however however the trust provided after the life estate. So, for example, a, a trust that we see a lot, uh, or will, that says, uh, life estate to my spouse, then re remainder to my children, A, B, and C. Right. Okay, well that's simple. Once the spouse dies, then we terminate the, the, the money going to the, to the spouse and we distribute it to A, B, and C. The, the problem is, particularly with a will, where they give the life estate to the spouse and then remainder to my children who are alive at her death. Well, then you technically need a probate somehow or a determination of death to determine who those people are. So if it's some sort of vague uh, distribution, then you may have trouble a after the death of the life tenant. But if it's, if it's straight out, it goes to, you know, these two or three or whatever people, then we can distribute that. Am I the only one who hears some of these issues? Can you raise your hand that way? I can know because I, okay, that's quite a few. There was a couple other questions. What is that? Can I kind of help you with explaining this to Margo about the, until the act of 1978 passed, right. you could leave your head right to whoever you wanted. Right. And, and, I and the shake got it, they could keep it forever, and it could just keep going out and out and out. Nobody has ever tried a case to stop that from happening. The yeah, this was a case in 1990 that that someone has, yeah. has asked that. us about, and you know, and we're trying to I help would, them. I would refer that to the superintendent and Mr. Wilcox. Oh, we have, and Nothing. we haven't heard. Is it? Nothing. Okay, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Okay. Are there other questions? I think there's one back there. Do these children have to be blood children? Uh, the remainder people after life state, they have to be Osages. So uh, not, not, not stepchildren, but pardon? Not stepchildren, but all they have to be Osages. They have to be Osages. What if so they're legally adopted? Yeah. Yeah. If they are if they are legally adopted by an Osage. They count as Osage for purposes of taking a head right. So they can take, an adopted child can take a head right in fee. They don't adopt them to the life state, regardless of what their actual blood quantum is, uh, or, or blood heritage. But if, if they're adopted by an Osage, then they can take it. Now, there is the 84 Act also introduced that you can't do it by, um, you. It, it doesn't count if they're collateral. So if 
somebody wrote a will and left it to their adopted child and their Osage, then that works because the child is deemed to be Osage for that purpose. Their brother adopted a child. That doesn't count because it's collateral. So if you can't leave it in fee to your brother or some other relative's adopted child. And keep in mind too, as I've said, that the only thing that matters is whether they are Osage. So there's no requirement in a will or trust that you leave it to your children or even to your spouse. You can leave it in fee to anybody who is Osage. And uh, just, uh, we occasionally have challenges to trust, which I'll get to in a minute, or challenges to will, which people say it's not right, it's not fair, it needs, I'm, I'm, the, I'm this child, so I ought to take it. If the will or the trust is validly executed by someone who has mental capacity to do it, then that, those don't serve as grounds for, for a challenge. So. so the adopted child then can leave that to their children, even though there is yes. no Yes, family. because at the point they're adopted, they are treated as Osage for all purposes. They can inherit collaterally, but they can leave it to their children. And I've even had the, the case where I have an adopted child of an adopted child. Uh -huh. And I have said, well, based on my reading of the statute, that, that whole line is treated as Osage. So, yeah. They, well, they have to be adopted by an Osage. Uh, I suppose it's possible they could be an Osage. Naturally, what's the word I'm looking for? They could, they could be of Osage blood themselves and take regardless, but they'd have to be Osage blood. Okay. When a life estate is set up, is it required that the life beneficiary designate a beneficiary? No. In fact, the life tenant doesn't get designated to a beneficiary because it ends at that person's life. It, when they die, it ends. And they don't have any ability to control who or what gets it after their death. That's, that's entirely in the, the original book of the trust. So where does that head right go once he dies? It, it goes to whoever has been designated as the remainder. So if... if as I say, yeah, in the wilderness trust. So if a person writes a will, leaves it to a spouse, and then for life, and then remainder to three children, then it automatically goes to those three children upon that spouse's death. Um, so the original trust or the original will really dictates where it goes after that. And that's why it's, it's really important when you're writing a will or a trust to, to really look at what you're doing to make sure that's what you want to do. The other thing that uh, we sometimes see is, and this it, it is sometimes kind of complicated, we sometimes, we try to figure out, well, is there any sort of unnatural order of death that would create an ambiguity? I can't think, actually think of an example, but we will sometimes get back with the person because uh, because the, the, the will or the trust creates some ambiguity as to how it goes. Um, we will occasionally, when we're looking at a trust, because we approve all the trusts, uh, we occasionally will write the person and say, well, there's this little problem and we are interpreting it this way. Let us know if that's not the way you intended it for it to be. So we, we can then change it. Uh, the trusts are approved by the superintendent. Um, and just, yeah, just carefully review any of those trusts or wills. Make sure it's really what 
you intend. And that's why I say we would like sometimes to try to figure out what if a child died before the parent, for example, how, how would it go then? Is there language in it that would cover that? So we, we do that. Um, the value in a trust is it bypasses the probate process. Now it doesn't bypass the approval process because the secretary still has to approve the trust. But you don't take it to probate. Now there are times um, because the trust only operates on restricted property. If a, an Osage has unrestricted property, then they may need to do that in the probate process. So sometimes you, you may not be able to cut out the probate process if you have significant unrestricted assets. Yes? I have restricted property that I just recently transferred from some of my family's name just into my name. And it was my understanding that it's restricted and it's all dealt with in the trust and it's dealt with the zero okay. and everything. Come to find out I need to go and file it through Osage County, because if something were to happen to me, yeah, we have the paperwork saying it goes to my heirs and my two sons, but somebody else could come in and, and cause some trouble, so I had to go and get title up on the hill through Wendy or something. Was that, was that <laughs> and restricted? And have to process it and, and put that and put That, that was restricted mind. land? Restricted land, three yeah. acres. Wow. Yeah, the, the Bureau has control, complete control of the head right and the IAM County. It's restricted land that you may have to file something in the county records. You do, and transfer. I didn't know that. It's needed in my mother, and, and none of us knew. Yeah. So, make sure you cross all of the teams and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> for trust, there is a requirement. It's sort of related to the right to challenge it because everybody who's disappointed by the will has the right to file a challenge to the will. You also have the right to file a challenge to the trust. Um, that's pursuant to an I, a tier board in the appeals case many years ago. So what happens is that when we uh, recommend approval of a trust to the superintendent, we write the individual and we say, we let them know that there is the, that heirs and beneficiaries have the right to challenge the trust. And we tell them that they can either do it now, you know, while they're still alive, or they can wait till after their death. And we say as a default, if we don't hear back from you, we will assume that you want to wait till after your death. Uh, it can be done either way, and I, I don't know that I've actually had many cases in which they wanted it done either way. But I, I think, in some respects, particularly if it's this, what I refer to as the standard sort of distribution, um, you know, life estate to the spouse or maybe to the children. I, I see no reason why you wouldn't go ahead and do that while you're still alive, just just to cut out that process after the death. But that's something that the individual gets to decide. We we send uh, not we the superintendent sends out a notice to all the heirs telling and beneficiaries telling they have a right to challenge the trust. Um, and gives them a thirty day window to, to write back. If someone challenges the trust, then we look at what they've done, what they've said. We may contact the beneficiaries of the trust because normally a challenge is going to come from someone who is an intestate heir who would take it if, if there was no trust. Uh, the beneficiaries have the right to know that there's been that challenge and what the allegations are. So we so we'll, we'll contact the the beneficiaries of the trust with that challenge. We then do a recommendation on that challenge to a superintendent. The superintendent uh, makes a decision and then, then they have the right to appeal it up, up administratively. Yes? Uh, Alan, as a, you know, uh, not everybody 
who receives a head right understands all the legalities of what that responsibility is, what, you know, of, of getting a will, getting it approved, or going to get a trust, or both, or going to the state. And as shareholders, um, you know, when we speak to them, um, I don't have all these answers. And, and you know, it's, and it's just, to me, it's too cliches to say, well, just go talk to the superintendent. And I think that, um, I think sometimes in speaking up, and I also believe that there's a responsibility, um, and I appreciate you being here, the responsibility that there needs to be like maybe a, a, a handbook of what happens when you become, um, you know, a shareholder. What, what those rights are, what would be a responsibility of, uh, you know, uh, we have Lacey who does our trust in our office. If you all don't know, please stop by our office. Um, but the other is, you're, you're giving us a lot of information, and I mean if we had a PowerPoint maybe, but I think maybe a handbook of, to show the process would be really advantageous to, our, to the Osage, because like you said, we're, we're not the five civilized tribes. We're, we're Osage and we are unique to ourselves of how we were set up, and exactly with all the 1906 amendments, and, um, for the you know um, the millennial generation that will become shareholders, I can guarantee you if they don't have it on the internet or their phone or something, it, it's <laughs> going to be yeah. <laughs> it's going to be lost. And you know, and um, um, you know, even myself, I know that I need to be taking care of um, you know some of these things. You know, of course, you don't ever think you're going to die, but I mean, I do have will. <laughs> I just haven't done my trust, and I'm in the office, so I should just, you know, tell Lacey, let's do this. But you know what? But I don't know all the other things about, um, because we really hear a lot from um, outside um, of the county of what what's the process. And you're giving us a ton of information in a short time. And I appreciate it. I want you to know that. Um. I guess we have not really thought about doing a handbook. Um, but is, is it, to me, it's a, a responsibility of the federal government to say an obligation. I would feel. I mean, I'm sure there's a cost associated with that. But to be to be truly informed, this Osage Shareholders Association. I mean, that's one of the things that they want to do. Well, is to but, give out information but like I mean, that's 180 people. We're talking about 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. And that responsibility, I mean, is the federal government. It's not, I get you. But we can't rely on them. We have to kind of, we need well, to do it Well, we've got to hold them accountable to do yeah, well, This is a, <laughs> you'll be waiting until <laughs> I can't, I can't agree to that today, but I would be glad to see that something like that could be accomplished. A checklist will, will, or something. I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, I will put this as an agenda item um, for the uh, Minerals Council because this is our obligation um, to our shareholders. That's what we're elected to do. And so I'm glad you brought this up. Yes. What is the sales uh, list? That I can't speak to. Um, that would be a decision that were made in the administration folks in BC. So I, I, I can't really speak to that. I don't know. My recollection was 1994. I have a question. Is this more of a superintendent responsibility? Or, or the, or your office? Or jointly? Um, because a lot of people, if, if you don't work in knowing these, the acronyms and what the responsibilities of what the Bureau is, OST, um, and you know, all these responsibilities, and honestly, Mr. I mean, Mr. Woodcock, you have it all in your head. You know it, <laughs> and we need to get it on um, on a booklet. That, and I know you can't. But even if it's the general information, 
I think this, I'm glad I sat in here and listened to you, and then um, I will be glad to put it on there. A lot of the general information is in the CFR regulations. I'm it's telling you, the, we've got people CFR back home that are, are like 20 year old annuitants, and I can guarantee you. I said CFR. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can guarantee you they can Google it and find it. Yeah, it's definitely it, online. Well, the, but, but still, the point is, is it's a responsibility that yes. the federal government has to the Osage people. Yes. Those Osage shareholders. Yes, it does. Um, well, I, I will take that comment. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I thank you. Some of the people here have no Okay. What happens to that head right? The, the head right or any restricted property, head right lands, I am land. It goes by what's called the, the statute of the testacy, the Oklahoma statute of the testacy. And that statute, I can't really <coughs> quote it, but that statute sets out how it goes if there's no will. Yeah, it would it would benefit the head rights, and the, it would still be subject to life estate rules. So, uh, my recollection, I'm speaking on top of my head, I have to look at it every time. If someone dies with a spouse and two children, let's say, then if that spouse is the mother of those two children. Is different if they're not the mother, but it's if that spouse is the mother of those two children, then she would take a half interest, and the two children would take a quarter interest each. So there's a way for it to be divided among the family. Now, if the spouse is non Osage, she can only take a life estate of that, and the remainder would be in those two children. So there is a way of it being divided. Now, you have to go through state court to get that done. But there is a way for it is to be divided. Okay, no, no spouse, no children, no will, no trust. Okay, if, if no will, no trust, and there's no wife or spouse or children, then it, it goes to other of their relatives. And you have to really look at the statute to see who that may be. So, for example, um, if they have a, a brother and a sister, the deceased that have brother and sister, then it would go generally to those two people. If those two were dead, but they had children, so there was nieces and nephews, it would go to those nieces and nephews. And you just have to look at that particular statute. I believe it's 84, Oklahoma statute 213, I think. <laughs> And it, it, it sets out, uh, it, it's, it sets out, yeah, and it goes into considerable detail, and it goes into really all the possibilities. And, so yeah. If you have restricted land, it has to be somebody Unless it's with a trust, it can be distributed pursuant to a trust. But, but if you have a will, or you have neither will nor trust, then it, then it has to be probated to single one. Yes? I've heard stories about a ghost account. Do you know what those are? Are there accounts set up with revenues from the head rights that have never been? No, I, we've okay. never heard of a ghost account. If, if the accounts there's always someone associated with an account. What about zombies? Now, we have had Just cases in which we cannot find the someone. And so that the money just sits in that account until we either find them or find their heirs. So uh, there, there's, there's times when we have states that we don't, we, we don't pass out any money because we don't know who it goes to. The famous example I think everybody's heard about is Gene Arlo Bello. That, that money just sat in the account until we eventually, somebody eventually established who the heirs were, and then we were able to distribute the money. But it can sit for quite a while. <laughs> but no, there's not a, there's not a, a ghost account. It, it, it's all in somebody's name. Now, if we don't know 
who they are or where they are, then they may just sit there for a while. Sit there in the trust it, it sits in it, it, an account from OSC. Yeah, an account from OSC. It, it sits in their IM account. It earns the interest. It's their some amount of interest that it earns. And then it will just sit there for as long as. And yeah. Until we, we, until the person comes forward or the person so I guess it would be as well. is dead and there's probate yeah. and so forth. So we, so. Someone has to come with the right paperwork. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, the Gene Harlow Bello case, I don't know, it was, it sat for know, 40 years or something like that before it was finally, to our satisfaction, there was a probate done that was that was that. No, no, it was a it was a really tiny head right, but because it had been sitting for so long and generating income and interest, it, it turned out to be a, a fair amount of money. But the head right itself was pretty small. So, um, okay, so if we do a trust. There is and there's a challenge to the trust, and we actually look at what's been submitted. We look at any response that they file, and then we make a recommendation to the superintendent. She will make the final decision. She doesn't have to follow what we say, but she will make the final decision. At that point, there can be an appeal. If the appeal then is to the regional director in Muskogee. And if you're still un unsatisfied, then you can go to the Interior Board of Indian Appeals. And if you're still unsatisfied, you can take it to federal court. Uh, that's a little different from the will approval process. When the superintendent makes a will approval, any appeal goes straight to the IBIA. It bypasses the regional director, goes straight to the IBIA. And then if they're still unhappy, then it can go to the uh, federal court. Uh, we have not had a federal court challenge to one of the will decisions probably in 30 years, but that is that is available if someone's still happy. Um, let's see. Um, The will versus the trust, I think I've already sort of touched on this, but the, the advantage to a trust is that it's all handled, at least if you restricted property, it's all handled by the Bureau. So you don't have to go to state court at all. The advantage to a will is that it can, it, it can distribute property that is not restricted. And a trust can't do that. So if you have unrestricted property in the estate, you'll have to figure out how to do that. Um, both the will and the trust have a uh, have a challenge process. The trust approval of the trust appeal process is somewhat longer because you have an extra step in there. But uh, with either of them, you're still not satisfied you can go to federal court. Um, and with either, of the, with either of these processes, there's no way that you can keep your beneficiaries from knowing what you're doing. So uh, you, may, you can keep it secret until you die, but after you die, then, then the, the disappointed kids are going to know. So uh, that is, uh, that's what I have to say about wills and trusts. Uh, again, we, we, we will make a decision about approving a, a will. We can, we, can look, we, can, we can review those both persons live. We will review all the trusts anyway. So, yes? If a person has their own trust outside of the federal government format, is that going to cost you a bill? No. <laughs> it won't work. If the, if the trust is, if you have done a private trust, the superintendent still has to approve that. And we occasionally have people who will do a private trust, not using our form. We will review that. As long as it meets the, the requirements, the superintendent is named as the trustee, 
and follow the rules about the life estates and whatnot, then we can approve that. We've had, in my experience, we've had one or two not like that. We had one in which they created sort of two separate trusts in the same document, and all the restricted property went pursuant to one trust in which the superintendent was named as the trustee and otherwise complied with the statute. So we were able to do that. It's just that if you're going to do that kind of more complicated thing, you probably ought to talk to us about it first. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.